Hello everyone, welcome to Talk Talks. I'm your host Andrew Kistner for the Oxford Center Talks. Today we are going to talk about cerebral palsy. Uh, it is Cerebral Palsy Awareness Month for the month of what are we, March already. And I've invited Alicia Heisey, I call her Dr. Alicia Heisey. Uh, she is a uh, DPT or Doctor of Physical Therapy. She's been on the program before. Um, she made me switch chairs to this chair, <laughs> uh, so that's okay, not a problem. But we're gonna talk to her today about uh, cerebral palsy, um, figure out what it is, what it entails, how it happens, and maybe get into some of the therapy that she provides. Um, it is an understatement for me to say she is the best PT I've ever met in my entire life. Thank and you. with you're welcome. With a child uh, with with cerebral palsy that's affected by cerebral palsy, uh, I, we've I've met a lot of PTs, and there's a lot of wonderful, great ones. She's the best by far. So we're going to talk uh, to Alicia for a bit. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's nice to be back. Yes, absolutely. I like having you on. Um, it's uh, you always share very insightful things. I learn something every time we talk. So well, good. I absolutely love it. So we'll dive right in. Okay. Uh, talk to me a little bit about cerebral palsy. But first, I want to get in case people don't know you, even mm -hmm. though you've been on the the podcast a couple times. Yep. Talk a little bit about you, your credentials, how you got there, kind of what your passions are. Yeah. Um, so like you said, I am a doctor of physical therapy. I spent seven years at Central Michigan to get my doctorate's degree. Um, fell in love with neuro-based population for treatment. Um, the gains that you can make with a neuro patient are just unreal. Um, the milestones that you can help them have, hmm. you know, you can give them their life back. Um, right. I fell in love with neuro during my first orthopedic rotation actually um, uh, and from there it was just it was night and day difference um, so from when graduation I dove right into treating the neuro population um, further went after um, credentials so I went first for my certified brain injury specialization okay. um, and from there took it a step farther um, and I am now a neurological clinical specialist which That's is awesome. the highest one in the neurological field within the physical therapy profession. So what was it about ortho? <laughs> that just didn't grab you. You know, some people really love ortho. Yeah, they do. Um, for me, it was um, the repetitiveness of okay. it. Okay. So, you know, you have a knee replacement very consistently. You do very similar things with yeah. every single knee replacement. Surgeons have protocols you follow. You right. Know, you, you do the same thing kind of over and over. Then you get a hip replacement, you do the same thing kind of over and right. over. You have a shoulder replacement, you do the same thing over and over. So it's just a little bit more repetitive. Some people love that aspect. Yeah. It's a great field to be in. For me, it was the neuro. Um, like I said, the milestones that you can, can meet in neuro are unbelievable. Um, during my clinical rotation, we helped a girl who had had a spinal cord injury, it was, has been kind of working through the injury of the spinal cord injury for about 14 years. And during my rotation, we helped her stand up for the first time in 14 years. And That's right nuts. then and there, I was like, whoa. <laughs> that right. was a milestone that she has been working on for 14 years that we just helped her get to. Yeah. You don't get those same kind of like wow moments right. in ortho. Right. Um, so. It, do, do you think it, it has to do with the your the use of your brain? You like to use your brain. I love to use my brain. And you like to problem solve. I do. Because everything is mm -hmm. completely different. Correct. Every injury is completely different. Correct. So Every, you have to really solve the problem, yes. figure it out. Every neuro neuro case is different. You can have a traumatic brain injury in one person and a traumatic brain injury in another person and the presentation is 100% different. Yeah. You never see the same injury over and over. So you have to think on your feet. You know, when they come in one day, they could be having a great day. They could come in the very next day and not be having such a great day. Your treatment changes every day based on huh. how they're presenting, if they're having, you know, other symptoms going on, progressions. Yeah. So it's just, it's more complex, more have to really think about it. So how many PTs in the field, let's take Michigan, is there, what's more prevalent? Is there more neuro or is there more ortho? There are definitely more ortho. Definitely more um, ortho. You can find ortho clinics all over the place. Yeah, I um, bet you there's 20 there's, of them in just Brighton. Correct. Um, Maybe more. Yes. Um, the There's just a higher prevalence of those ortho-based injuries. Sure. Um, you know, it's just, it's the way it works. Um, right. 
but the neuro side is just more of a niche. Um, yeah. It really takes someone wanting to do neuro, wanting to know the neuro side to treat a neuro population the way right. that they deserve. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. I get that. All right. That is awesome, as always. Uh, I love to hear kind of your story and what makes you different uh, yeah. than, than other PTs. Um, let's talk a little bit about cerebral palsy. Obviously, you know this has affected our lives, yes. my family's life, uh, greatly through the years. Um, and for those that don't know, I have a daughter with cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. uh, we got a diagnosis um, later than most. Hers was uh, hypotonic, and maybe you can get into a little bit mm -hmm. of the differences, but hypotonic cerebral palsy, so I call it the flimsy kind, mm -hmm. the lack of muscle tone, and not the, the rigid kind that you spastic. more commonly, mm -hmm. the spastic kind that you more commonly yeah. see. And so really, this has yeah. meant a lot to us, and PT was really our godsend. Um, and uh, when I came to the Oxford Center, I saw things I'd never seen before. Mm -hmm. And we've been PT for a long, many, many, many years. Since <laughs> yes. she was nine months old, we came at, I think, four or so. She just turned four. Mm -hmm. And this changed our life uh, from that neural side of things. Yes. Um, I don't know necessarily what the PT clinic that many that we had been to, I would say they're probably more ortho. I don't know. Maybe they were neuro, but it's different here. Mm -hmm. So talk to me a little bit about cerebral palsy, kind of start at the basis okay. of how does it happen? Mm -hmm. So cerebral palsy in general is kind of one of those umbra umbrella terms. So it's yeah. just a group of disorders that impact the motor system. So cerebral meaning brain, palsy meaning the muscles, the control of the muscles. Um, so cerebral palsy is actually the most common diagnosis for children with motor disabilities. Interesting. Um, yes. Crazy, isn't it? It is, um, and that's kind of how our story happened. Yeah. You know, they, we didn't know what was wrong, and she's two and a half, Correct. and we still don't know what's wrong. We mm -hmm. know she's, there's definitely something wrong. Right. And they gave us that diagnosis mm -hmm. literally without even seeing her. Correct. The, we went into her new doctor, developmental delay doctor, and she said, like within the first one minute, I've reviewed all of the information, all of her files and tests, and I'm going to diagnose her with hypotonic cerebral palsy. Correct. Because we don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. And so, <laughs> and most of the time, they don't actually know the cause. Right. It is, you know, a some sort of developmental brain dysfunction or right. an injury that impairs the development of the brain. Okay. So cerebral palsy happens from conception to one year of age. Okay. Somewhere in there because that's when the brain itself is developing the most. If it happens when it when your the baby is developing in the body or within 28 days after birth, it's called congenital. Okay. 85 to 90 percent of diagnoses with cerebral palsy are actually the congenital side. There's a the, the more rare side of um, cerebral palsy is the acquired. So that's okay. after 28 days, that first month of life to the first year of life. Those ones usually um, occur because of an infection, like meningitis, or because of um, a head trauma. Okay. Um, but cerebral palsy in general is just that damage to the brain mostly affects the motor systems. Um, every cerebral palsy case is different, Yeah. Um, but it always impacts the motor system. Right. You will get, in addition to that, in some cases, the intellectual disabilities, mm -hmm. you know, the vision impairments, the scoliosis of the spine, the contractures of the joints, all of those is kind of additional, but cerebral palsy in general is a motor dysfunction. Interesting. Yeah. So uh, is it classified technically as a, as a TBI, traumatic brain injury? Yes. Um, so it falls within the, the brain injury category. So traumatic is where the difference comes in. Makes sense. Um, so it's not technically a traumatic injury. It is Could a, be, possibly. Could be, yes, and that's okay. where the acquired, the acquired side of cerebral palsy can be. It can be because of a traumatic brain injury. Okay. But cerebral palsy in and of itself is kind of that other brain injury state. Okay. Um, so yes, but no. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. uh, I guess you really have to... If you're going to classify it, you have to get more information. Yes. You know, did it occur when and how? Mm -hmm. you know, when so and that, how. That makes sense. Um, and sometimes they don't know. We don't know. Um, you know. Grace we, had a great pregnancy. Like one push, she was out, mm -hmm. like no issues. Um, and really, we didn't notice any um, issues until about six months. Six right. months, life, she just literally shut off, stopped progressing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's when we started trying yeah. to figure out what's going on. So yeah, so in the cerebral palsy in general, once you have cerebral palsy, it's not progressive. Okay. It doesn't get worse. Once you have it, you have it. Um, 
the part that changes as the body grows and as development grows is those symptoms further impact progression of functional movement. That makes sense. So if you have spasticity, you might be able to roll around on the ground, you might be able to crawl, but you might not be able to control that spasticity enough to make it to those next milestones. Yeah. So a lot of parents don't start seeing it until those motor milestones aren't made. Yes. Um, one of the biggest, one of the biggest pieces to you know that best possible outcomes is early intervention. Right. But so many times you don't really see it until those later motor milestones start getting later and later. Yeah, that makes sense. So talk to me a little about uh, the treatment um, that you specifically provide. I remember yeah. sitting in the office and knowing the term cerebral palsy, but not knowing anything about it um, with this doctor and knowing there wasn't a cure for it uh, per se, but we asked the doctor, what is what do we do? Yeah. You know, as a parent, you just hit this huge, you know, mm -hmm. weight on you now and you don't know what to do. And she said, therapy is your life. Correct. Um, yeah. So it really depends on the type of, the type of cerebral palsy. Okay. So there's four main types of cerebral palsy. See, learn something new. I thought there you, was two. <laughs> yes. Um, so you have your spastic cerebral palsy, which is your very stiff muscles. So okay. the kind that's opposite to little Gracie. Um, you know, you have difficulty controlling those muscles because they are so stiff. With that spastic cerebral palsy, these are the, the kiddos that, if not treated early on, end up with the scoliosis. They end up with the joint contractures Got because it. those muscles impair movement. Right. Um, so that's spastic. Um, actually, 80% of 85% ish, somewhere in somewhere there, there. Um, have the spastic version of okay. cerebral palsy. Now, to narrow all of that down, there's three different types of spastic cerebral palsy. So you That's have, your, you have okay. your diplegic, which is, it may, mainly, mainly impacts the lower extremities, sometimes the arms a little bit, but the okay. legs are the most impacted. You have your hemi, which is half of your body, so your right half or your left half are impacted, or you have your quadriplegic, which impacts the whole body. So can you attribute those, especially the halves, can you attribute that to an injury in one, one side the of other, the brain? Usually, yep. That's so the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body and the left side of the brain controls the right half of the body. Huh. So if you have that hemiplegic, it's more so left or right. Um, similarly, the motor pattern in the brain is, is the upside down homunculus. So the legs are in the central part and then he wraps kind of out to the outside. Okay. So if you see some of that, like that lower body, most it's that centralized brain um, right. where you get both halves. Okay, that um, makes sense. And then, you know, your quadriplegic is, is more, of, more of the impaired um, right. because it impacts the whole body. So that's spastic. Um, and then you go into your dyskinetic. Uh, so your dyskinetic is just you can't control your body. Right. It moves, it rises, it, it, it does all the whatever crazy things, whatever it wants, to do, whatever whatever wants, wants to, do. to do, whenever it wants to do it. Yeah. It's very hard to control, control that part of the body. So a spastic treatment is much different than the dyskinetic treatment. Okay. Um, the third type is the ataxic, which is just the poor coordination, poor balance. Usually the hypotonic kind of fall into this okay. category just because if you're hypotonic, you really don't have the balance, you don't have the co right. coordination, you don't have the postural control because everything is just kind of right. loose and not really used in the right way. Which makes a lot of sense yeah. for Gracie. I mean, she's mm -hmm. been walking for a couple of years now, yep. but still balance. Balance and, and coordination and that co posture yes. are her. <laughs> yes. <laughs> her she biggest. gets there, but it sometimes uh, looks pretty bad. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's it's she loves life she, she has no idea life. and we love it yep. uh but yeah she'll she'll get there but she'll be teetering and, yep. and it's all, fun. all of that postural control um and then the last one is mixed so it's okay. a combination of those three in some way shape or form hmm. so how we treat cerebral palsy depends on the type of cerebral palsy and the presentation of it makes sense we can do your normal physical therapy where it's just like one to five times a week for one hour sessions but we also offer what is called our intensive physical therapy where we use the therasu method which, for those that don't know, that's what made a difference in our life. Correct. Um, that is where we see the biggest differences. Um, because it is three hours a day, five <laughs> days a week, for four to six weeks straight. Yeah. Um, we, and it is intensive. That is yep. exactly what it needs to be. Um, right. We are trying to change brain-based patterns at the neurological level. Right. And in order to do that, we need consistency, we need repetition, we need the intensity in order yep. to make a difference. One hour treatments, we just don't have enough time to get through all of the things we need to get through to begin to work on function. Right, and it's that's what, when I think back on our journey, you know, here at the Oxford Center, 
we were in therapy for a very long time for 45 minutes to an hour once a week Correct. you know and I can't imagine where she would be now yeah. you know she might not even be walking if we didn't uh, yeah. go through intensive or therapeutic therapy it just it wasn't enough it's not enough to make a difference it's not enough to make a difference by the time you get even started into that 45 minute session you're already 15 minutes into it and if that right. that kiddo that adult has any of that spasticity you know any of those dyskinetic movements even the ataxia the poor control poor balance um, there's so many things that you have to work on before you can even start to work on function right you know you have your core strength you have your um, flexibility you have your motor control you have all of these other pieces that need to be addressed before you can even begin to think about walking or right. sitting or transferring or doing all of these functional based patterns. So if you're only doing 45 minutes, you might be able to get you stretched out enough so you feel a little bit better for the day, but right. what is that going to do long term? The it's, progress is like you, not you don't have the time there. to make progress. Whereas in the three hour session, I can spend that first hour getting the body ready, spend that next hour working on some of those smaller skill sets, those part tasks, and then we spend that last bit actually working on function. Right. So it is a very long session, but um, you know when I was taking the course and going through all of this, they described it as, you know, kids are meant to run and play and move all day long. Right. Three hours is nothing. Right. I have a four-year-old at home, and my goodness, if I could keep <laughs> up with him, I I would. But for him, three hours of movement is is yeah. nothing um, right. because that's what he does all day long. We didn't long. burn off breakfast. We didn't even burn <laughs> off breakfast. Um, kids are meant to move. Yeah. So three hours sounds like a lot to you and I because that's like for us, three hours of going to the gym. Right. That is a lot. Our bodies aren't meant for it. I go um, zero, zero hours and I feel great. <laughs> uh, but our kiddos, on the other hand, their bodies want it. It thrives right. in it and it does, it does really well. And you can see it as it starts to progress through those four weeks. Their body starts loving it. Yep. Um, it, you know, the brain wants to move. It wants right. to move in the most functional patterns. And when you are just kind of fighting those cerebral palsy um, symptoms, it's not doing that. Right. So it's not energy efficient. It's taking all of this time and taxing. It's draining. Whereas if we can change that, these three hours just fly by. Um, yeah, and I remember when we started intensive. Our first week, ever we did four intensive rounds. Mm -hmm. Um, over two years, and that first week was rough. <laughs> it is she was rough. not used to being <laughs> no. active for three hours Correct. in that manner. Right. Um, but after that first week, she mm -hmm. got it. She, she was great. It. Yeah. She had no problem. Um, but I mean, if you look at a professional athlete too, right? What professional athlete, in order to change a skill set to improve in their function, right. trains for forty-five minutes for <laughs> one hour a week? Yeah. What? Yeah. And now we're expecting these kids who were asking their bodies to change dramatically for the entire body, right. to do that one time a week for 45 minutes, how, does, how do those things make sense? Right. It, it doesn't. There, there is no way that any sort of professional athlete, anyone who is working to progress to that next level, only works right. out for 45 minutes one time a week. Yep, and um, I think the thing, I mean, it, and it sucks because intensive therapy isn't covered by insurance. Correct. Um, it doesn't fit the mold, you know. They'll cover one hour, one hour, forty or uh, once a week. Yeah. You know, it doesn't fit the mold. But when I, I remember going crunching numbers, mm -hmm. and it, it, it basically played out to the same. Correct. As far as costs, yes. Uh, we were kind of self-insured or through one of those med sharing plans. Uh, I was owned my own company at the time, and it really you're just all your your costs are up front rather than spread out over 30 or 40 weeks or whatever Correct. it is you know that you get with your plan um but the difference in the time devoted to it made all the difference in the world correct um so from a cost standpoint it really doesn't it's not that much different than paying you know um out of pocket for these services uh over a span of time or all at once right but you make way more progress you make way more progress absolutely um and then you know once you once you get to those milestones, once you get through those four to six weeks, then it's the endurance piece. Right. Your body needs to get used to moving in that new way, yeah. and then you can do the next round, which is right. you know why you guys ended up doing four rounds is because Gracie had a lot to learn. Yeah, we did um, eight. Uh, the first one was we got cut short a little bit from COVID. I mm -hmm. think we did six or seven weeks. Mm -hmm. We did eight weeks. Yep. Um, all other all other rounds. Yeah. Uh, because it just saw the benefit. We knew it. We knew yeah. it was there. Mm -hmm. Worked but awesome. Sometimes it takes multiple rounds, but you know we we take for granted our movement. We really right. do. Um, but when you're trying to retrain all of those movements from how do you lay on the ground to how you get all the way up to how you walk, 
it takes so much balance, so much coordination, so much motor planning, motor sequencing, that you have to start in little intervals. Right. And your brain has to get good at those smaller steps first before you can get to those bigger steps. Yeah, and you can see there's a plan and mm -hmm. everything you do, there's always a plan. There's always a plan. Uh, <laughs> a method to my madness, as I like to tell all my patients. That's right. So talk to me a little bit about um, other, th other th therapies, mm -hmm. you know, that maybe we can utilize or that um, parents with kids with cerebral palsy need to look at um, outside of maybe PT or maybe it does involve just PT. Yeah, um, so just here alone, um, uh, so many kiddos, even though cerebral palsy is a motor dysfunction, it impacts the motor systems of the body, so many of these kiddos have those secondary involvements, whether right. it's intellectual, cognition, you know, the vision, the speech, the the swallowing, all of those other pieces. So, you know, you have, we have our occupational therapists here who are great at what they do. They work on all of that fine motor, all of the upper yeah. body, that postural control. They really go very well with physical therapy. They take all of those self-care tasks. Right. Um, you know, the brushing of the teeth, the brushing of the hair, the beginning to bathe themselves. Eating with a fork. Eating with a fork, working, which is on working now. with Gracie. <laughs> um, all of those tasks that, you know, parents with those kiddos with cerebral palsy just they want their kiddo to be able to do. Right. Um, and OT can really work on those. Uh, and then we have our speech department. Our speech department can really start to work on your communication skills. You know, some of these kiddos are nonverbal because they have right. this intellectual difficulty or they have the speech or the motor control in the throat itself. Um, uh, swallowing, all of those right. pieces are, are our speech team. Um, so they can really help kind of combat some of those symptom presentations as well and kind of give us the best opportunity possible. You know, if you want to take it a little bit farther in what we have here, this brain disorder um, tends to cause a lot of missed signals, missed interpretations right. of how those brain patterns are firing. Um, we run neurofeedback here. So right. our neurofeedback team, you know, runs the runs the big scan and that um, analyzes how the brain works and then sets up a program directly individualized to that kiddo or to that young adult, older adult, whatever it may be, but can start to um, optimize the right. brain's systems, which goes very well with physical therapy. So as we're attempting to change, change those neurological processes, right. we can actually you know, calm that brain down or help kind of navigate some of those yeah. changes from that neurological s standpoint. Neurofeedback is one of the coolest things I think I've ever it is really neat, isn't um, it? watched happen. Um, and then we have our hyperbarics. So right. our hyperbarics is phenomenal for kiddos with cerebral palsy. Yeah. Um, anyone in general, but phenomenal for our kiddos with right. cerebral palsy just because you know, the healing benefits that come from that 100% oxygen pressurized deep into right. those cells for healing. You pair the benefits of you know, the hyperbaric oxygen therapy to the brain itself, but in addition, I'm challenging your body three hours a day. Right. Um, the recovery that we can see if we pair hyperbarics with this intensive therapy is unreal because yeah. now your delayed onset muscle soreness or your muscle soreness, your fatigue, your achiness that comes from a three hour workout right. is now combated a little bit in hyperbarics. It Absolutely. helps those muscles heal, it helps <laughs> those ligaments heal, it helps all of those things that I just made work really hard right. heal so that way you're better prepared that next day to go again. Yeah. Um, so you get all of those big cerebral palsy benefits from hyperbarics, but it also benefits just the intensive therapy as well with that yeah. healing. Awesome. So we kind of can do all of the things right. um, from the brain to the body to everything in between. Yeah, absolutely. Talk to me a little bit about, uh, I know you've treated a lot of kiddos with cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about some of the successes that you've seen uh, from just the PT side of things even. Uh, I love... Don't name. Don't <laughs> I know. Name. Um, I love working with my kiddos with cerebral palsy. Yeah. Um, I have not had one yet that hasn't wanted to get better. Yeah. And kids in general, they want to get better. They do. They they can feel that this isn't quite right. They right. know that it's not quite right. Um, the benefits that we see are just monumental, and that's why yeah. I love my neuro side. Right. Um, you know, you take a kiddo that isn't walking, can't walk is just working on crawling and you get them to where they can get up on their own and they can start standing and then you get them to the point where they're walking Yep. and you walk out into that lobby one day and the we're walking to the parent and the parents like oh my god like yep you get those those big moments and then you work so hard to get yep. there absolutely but what you just did for that kiddo was change everything right and it's like 
I remember Gracie, when the more mobile she became, the more intellectually things yes. started to take off. Correct. They're, they're getting out more, they're seeing more, they're mm -hmm. experiencing more, and that, that all those dots start to connect. They do. Yeah. The brain starts to put them all together. There's um, a big learning piece that comes from the change in the vision perception. So when you're crawling, everything is here. This right. is all you see. As soon as we get you upright and standing, now all of a sudden your world is this big. Yeah. And so you get to start taking in everything around you, up, down, left, right, and surrounding right. you, whereas before it was just kind of here. Um, and the ability to explore. And like, the ability to explore. You yeah, now, Gracie, she, she was sometimes lazy, you know? Yeah. Uh, and we'll be mad at her saying that. But she, like, I want to go see what that is, but I'm not going to crawl over there. Yeah. But now that she can walk over there, she walks everywhere. Yes. Uh, because she, it's easy for her to do. Correct. Yeah. And then, you know, if you help them climb on coffee tables That's and, right. you help them <laughs> and you help them now explore their world and learn yep. their interaction with the world around them. It's just a whole different level of experience um, and a whole learning experience when your world opens up. Right. Yep. Last question. Um, biggest advice for parents that just got that hit? They, they just got that news that, hey, we're going to diagnose your kiddo with cerebral palsy. Early intervention is key. The earlier you start therapy, the better the outcomes become. Yeah. And I know that that is hard to hear and it's hard to face and it is a big change. No parent wants to hear that. Right. No parent wants to get that news. But the sooner you can get them into therapy, even if those symptoms don't look that bad yet or they are mild, the faster that kid grows without having the appropriate treatment, learning the proper mechanics, learning how to use their body that isn't going to work out quite the way they want it to, right. the better. The quicker we can kind of cut some of those compensatory strategies, a kid's going to do what they got to do to right. figure out how to start to navigate their world. The sooner we can train them to do it in the right way, the easier it is for that kid to learn. You take an older kiddo, and that's fine too, but they have learned all of these patterns right. and their brain has made all of these connections that we now need to try to undo to then recreate new ones. And right. it's a much harder cyclical process because the brain will always revert to what it knows. So if we teach it what it needs to know the right way the first time around, it sets up for much better success long yeah. term. Um, in you know, the secondary complications that come with it, if you know, it's progressed or long term right. not really addressed, you know, you have your scoliosis, your curvature, it starts out functional, and then it starts to get structural. Once it gets to that point, it is. Um, right. You know, there's not much that they can do other than put big old rods in the back. And that doesn't that's, sound fun. No, um, which leads to all sorts of other complications and contractures. You know, if you have that spastic form of cerebral palsy, those muscles are going to fight. They want to be tight. Right. Whereas functional movement, weight-bearing movement, can help decrease that specificity. We can train it to work in a functional way and reduce the risk for contractures. Yeah. So early intervention is key. Get the therapy early on, help that, help that kiddo out to the best yep. of your ability. Like your physician said, therapy is your life now. It is. Um, and there- Even though it's soul crushing news, you gotta jump in. You gotta jump in. That mm -hmm. was uh, my advice. I remember meeting somebody at one of the trade shows that we do in like downtown Brighton and Pinckney and Hall and whatnot. And they had just gotten that diagnosis and um, and I was telling a little about Gracie, I said, I hope I'm not overstepping just knowing you, getting to know you, you need to jump in. You mm -hmm. need to get into every single therapy that's absolutely available. Mm -hmm. Get her into H, H bot. get her into intensive, like I talked about everything, uh, because the quicker you get um, a grasp on this situation, the better life will be for her, mm -hmm. yes. you know? And uh, that's my advice as well. You just gotta go. You just gotta go, 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 go and mm -hmm. get it done. Well, hey, it's been an absolute pleasure having you. you on here. Um, uh, we're gonna stay around and talk a little bit more specifics on intensive physical therapy. Um, I don't know when that video will necessarily air, but um, I want a lot more information on suit therapy. So feel free, we'll, Carter will probably link that in this video here. But thank you very much for joining us on Talk Talks uh, for another episode uh, airing every Thursday. Please like and subscribe, and we will see you guys next week.